Hello, my name is Ian, and I'm from Orange Grove Middle School, and we are here with Daniel Jose Older at the Tucson Festival of Books 2018. How are you today? I'm great, and you you pronounced the heck out of my name. That was great. Oh, was, yay. People botch it all the time, but you really nailed it, so good job. Awesome. I appreciate it. Sweet. So what was your favorite part about writing the book Shadow Shaper? Ooh, excellent question, Ian. I really, I really love writing, so I enjoyed the whole process from start to finish. The parts I enjoyed less were editing because I don't like editing as much as I like writing because for me, writing is like where all the fun is. You know, you get to come up with cool stories, like what could be better? Um, so I don't know if I had one favorite part of the writing. I w and also that process was very long. Like I edited it a lot of times, started almost from scratch at different points and then rewrote so many sections. Um, but I really just had, a, I, I'd say I, I especially had a good time towards the end there's a period, there's a moment when you're kind of coming up on the end of a book where the book really does seem to take a life of its own and you're just along for the ride and then you're just going and going and going and you almost can't stop. And that's always the most fun. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> so as a kid, um, what did you want to be when you grew up? Oh, interesting. I actually want, one of my, I either wanted to be a political cartoonist or uh, make monsters for George Lucas or Jim Henson. So oh, nice. I kind of feel like I, I'm doing both of those things right now in a weird yeah. way. Even though I don't draw cartoons, I don't actually make monsters, but I do have a Star Wars book coming out, which is really cool. Where oh, I got to awesome. come out. Yeah, I got to come up with new monsters for Star Wars. And, you know, there's a lot of um, discussion in my work. Even though my work is fantasy, there's a lot of talk about real world stuff and politics and culture and art and what that means. So there's there's a way in which those childhood dreams are still coming true. Nice. So you're you're making these monsters, mm -hmm. but with words. Exactly. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm Isel. I'm from University High School. So for our first question, you've written books for adults before. What motivated you to write Shadow Shaper for teens? Ah, excellent question. I actually Shadow Shaper is the first full book that I ever wrote. Um, so when I first sat down, it was in 2009, and I just was like, you know, I re I really loved Harry Potter. And I also really felt like Harry Potter didn't speak to me directly as a Latino. And I felt like fantasy as a whole really was just, there's just this big lack of our people, uh, people of color, especially in fantasy. And so as much as I loved Harry Potter, I also, and as much as I love fantasy in general, I also wanted to write a, a sort of an angry love letter to it saying like, you know, where are we? And, how can, and here's how we could be in it. Um, and to me, that was that always has meant more than just like painting faces brown um, or black, but really to like imbue the, the book with the depths of who we are. So the mythology of the book, you know, would be one that I recognized as home, the rhythm of the book, um, the setting of the book. All those things were really important to me. And I knew that's what I wanted to do. And knowing that kind of allowed me to really be playful. And so when I was writing the book, like I said earlier, I, you know, I took it apart many times and put it back together. So many times, it was like a Frankenstein book. Like I really just wrestled with that story because I was learning how to write a novel with that book. Um, but because I knew that the core of the book was to tell a story about people of color, um, you know, just being exactly who we are, confronting the things we confront in America today um, with the fantasy, with magic and, you know, fighting bad guys and all adventure. Um, that allowed me to, to just be flexible and playful and change the book around a lot. That's actually really interesting. Um, so kind of related to that, you used a lot of Spanish phrases mm -hmm. and words in this book um, a lot of the time without explaining their meaning. So did you expect readers to understand this? Or? <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> I did it in part because that's sort of a truth of a lot of Latino households is that we grew up, you know, with Spanish just seamlessly woven into the fabric of our lives. Um, I think there's enough context cues for each of them to, for you to be able to know, all right, it's probably about this. You might not know the exact meaning of the word, but you get enough sense of it so it doesn't throw off your whole reading and you have to go and look it up, right? Like, and that's sort of the, the difficult balance. But you'll notice, too, that the words aren't italicized. Um, and that is a, a fight that I really take very seriously because when we speak Spanish, if we're bilingual, we don't put extra emphasis on the words. You know, it's and that's the beauty of it. It's so seamless when for bilingual people just to slide in and out of Spanish and English and create essentially a whole new language, Spanglish, out of it. Um, and it isn't about pausing and saying, ah, now I will switch to Spanish. Supermercado, you know, <laughs> like it, that's really awkward. And that's what italics kind of do. So it was really important to me 
um, to make sure that that wasn't that they didn't jump off the page in that awkward way. Um, because I was trying to ultimately a writer has to tell the truth about the world we live in. Um, and that's a truth, especially that I don't see enough in books. We're seeing it more and more now, um, but we haven't seen it enough with that, that seamlessness. And I wanted that on the page. Hi, I'm Vivienne. I'm here with Danielle Jose Oda and at the Tucson Festival of Books. And what I want to ask is, what is your inspiration for the characters in these books? Are they based off of real people or did they just kind of pop into your head? Mm, thank you, Vivienne. That's a great question. I um, Usually characters are a mishmash of lots of different things. So sometimes there'll be kind of an actual person that I'll kind of use as a base and then be like, okay, it's this person, but they're an assassin. You know, or they came back from the dead or whatever. And then you just bring in new elements. There's this person plus that person, but they they have this for a job. And then you, because you're not usually doing a direct, like this is that person. Um, and then there's some characters that literally just show up out of nowhere. Sierra is actually one of those where when I first was coming in that period, when I was coming up with what Shadow Shaper was going to be, I kind of asked the universe, which is to say my imagination, you know, who's going to step up? and fill this role and be this hero in this magical journey that I'm about to, you know, create. And it was Sierra and Sierra was like, it's me and it's not going to be anybody else. And I'm like, whoa, I don't even know if I can write a girl. You know, like I'm not from Brooklyn. I'm not Afro Latino. Um, there's a lot of things that are different between me and Sierra. And what that meant was I had to take very seriously that responsibility of writing someone who's not me and very seriously consider that I might not be the right writer for this story. Um, ultimately, I think I probably wasn't when that moment happened, but I made sure I became that writer in the process of writing the book. And that's something that happens that until you've written a book, you kind of don't know almost is that the book changes the writer while we're writing the book. And you, you're a different writer when you finish the book than you were when you started it. So I really took that very seriously. And I really made a point of listening to the women in my life and paying attention to what they were saying and not trying to protect myself on the page in all the different ways that people with privilege can. Um, you know, whether it's just erasing our even existence or pretending like the world is just kind of okay and everything's all right and there's nothing to worry about. Just these different lies that we tell that kind of help get us off the hook. I couldn't, I knew I couldn't do that if I wanted this character to really come to life. And so it became a very self-reflective process to check my own, um, my own stuff, you know, all the things I carry, all my privileges, things like that, in order to write this book well. That's interesting. Um, getting a little personal here. There mm -hmm. is a big subplot in the book mm -hmm. of racism. Have you had any experiences with this or? Yeah, I'm a Latino in the United States. So, I, you know, we live that on a daily basis, um, whether it's understanding, you know, what different cultural aspects um, are doing to us and have done to us historically or just the erasure of that narrative and the fact that even to talk about uh, racism in the United States suddenly gets called divisive by people who it makes uncomfortable. So all, all those layers of it, I think, are there. And I think just in the question of culture and how we uh, have been asked to kind of become something we're not as a price that we're supposed to pay to, quote unquote, integrate or, or become a part of society. You know, um, you know, we Latinx people built this country as much as um, other people who are here. And, and a lot of it was through our blood. And I think those are stories we have to be able to tell if we're going to really come together as a country, which we haven't yet really figured out how to do. Um, so I, I think all those are really important. And I, I think um, being able to, to also just look and have deeper conversations in, in communities of color and understand, like I was saying earlier, about privilege and about the different ways that we are oppressed and the different ways we oppress each other. And how does that, how can we heal? The only way we can heal is to look at that and be honest about it and deal with it. And you know, just closing our eyes isn't gonna make it go away. Hello, I'm Catherine, and my question is, is there anything that runs in your life, like being a shadow shaper in uh, Sierra's life and family? Like, she has doctors that run throughout her family. Is there anything like that in your history? Um, interesting. You know, I think a lot about ancestors, and I think um, a lot of the central story of shadow shaping is about, you know, it's about spirits, right? It's a ghost story. Um, so we are so used to seeing ghost stories where the ghost of the bad guy that jumps out and kills people and has a problem that they didn't solve and they're alive, so then they have to go and whatever. And that's cool. But uh, so, so many people in the world have a very different and much more complex and often much more loving relationship to our dead. 
which is really to say to history, right? So just in line with what we were just talking about, um, if, if the idea that if you can't really face your history, not only are you doomed to repeat it, but it will devour you, right? Um, I wanted to tell a story where the ancestral power was one that really lifted up the main character. And in Shadow Shaper, it very literally lifts her up, right? And helps her travel over the ocean. Like, it gets helps her. It saves her life. Um, and that's important to me. Um, I'm part of a culture that, that, that honors our ancestors. And so that was something I just wanted to see on the page of a book. Um, similarly, I grew up in a family that loves stories and loves art. And, and, and hold that as something sacred. And so the other thing that saves Sierra really is art, right? It's the combination of spirit and art comes together in this form that's called shadow shaping and actually like swoops in and saves the day. What that is really is a metaphor. And I think all fantasy novels in a way are some form of metaphor. If we do it, if we do our job right, you don't even notice that it's a metaphor because you're so involved in the story. But ultimately, that's that's the story of art saving your life. Um, so it doesn't play out necessarily in our in our lives outside of books where we like smack a wall and a mural comes to life and whoops a bad guy for us. It plays out in that we're having like a really, really terrible day and we don't know where to turn. And then like our favorite song comes on the radio and helps us make sense of this one moment. And it's sometimes they're not usually they're not even a happy song. It's a song about being <laughs> depressed. But you can say, oh, you know, this is someone else who felt w felt what I feel right now. And so that's going to get me through this moment. And then I'll get to the next moment. And so art will save your life, right? And so it plays out in different ways, in different contexts. But ultimately, that was the story I was trying to tell. That is so inspirational. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. So how did you gain the inspiration for the romance aspect of the book? Mm. And, you know, I've really rewrote that particular part of it a lot of times, um, mostly because it's so hard to get that tone just right of that feeling of like you kind of feeling someone or maybe you're really feeling them and there were there's so many different drafts where at first uh sierra is like really into robbie from jump and then where robbie's really into sierra from jump and she's kind of like oh you're really sketchy and then she kind of grow he grows on her i just redid it over and over um but you know i just wanted I wanted Sierra to have like this exciting thing that wasn't just about the magic that she was investigating. Um, I wanted her to have just a spark with another person in her life. Um, and I also wanted her to have a whole, it's really also about just having a lot of different people and a lot of different relationships around her. And I think what we see a lot and what I don't like in a lot of uh, narratives about teenagers is they only get to kind of have one relationship. Um, and it's usually a boy and a girl romance, like a very heteronormative romance. And um, it's it's that I think that's fine to have romance. I mean, I think that's just that's who we are as humans. Right. So teenagers are going to have that. The problem is, like, it can't just be that. So I was cool, like with having that romance in there, as long as there was also a whole community around her, her family, her friends. Like, Shadow Shaper is as much about Sierra and her friends as it is about Sierra and Robbie, right? Like, they they jump off the page, too. Um, and, in fact, some of the novellas are really more about the friends than they are about Sierra because they just became so alive. So it was about balancing out, like, who are Sierra's people? Um, and so often in fantasy, we just get these detached kind of, like, solo entities that are out in the world with no community and no people. And that's one of the most important things about who you are is who are your people, right? Like, where do you come from? Who's got your back? Who's looking out for you? It might not be your blood family, but chances are there's someone out there that's like really ready to put themselves on the line for you. And that's a powerful thing. And that's a, yet another thing that I really just wanted to be on the page um, and to surround Sierra with a loving community. Ian again. Hello. Hey, what's up? <laughs> so um, you build this book, Shadow Shaper, around, um, of course, the people called Shadow Shapers. Right. So um, these people interact with the shadows and, um, and interact with art as well. So what would you do if you were a Shadow Shaper? Oh, man. <laughs> that's a good... You know, no one's asked me that, Ian. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, a good, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a... Uh, Trailblazing. You know, there you go. <laughs> I would probably build monsters. Like like I said, when I was young, I wanted to build monsters um, for movies and stuff. So I would probably make like really creepy, horrible sculptures of all kinds of demons and things and then just set them loose on the world. And everyone would hate me. 
but they would maybe be nice monsters. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying they would go kill people or anything. I just think there's there's such a power in monsters and in, in the stories of monsters throughout history. I think they're fascinating, whether it's like dinosaur monsters or um, monsters in, you know, mythology or monster modern monsters, you know, from Frankenstein and Dracula on up. There's just they're so cool. And they're like, you know, sometimes they're sympathetic characters and sometimes they're horrible characters and they just span all this humanity. Um, but I just love the idea of just you can create something and then you can put life into it and then it takes off and does its own thing, which not for nothing is basically what it feels like to write a book. Awesome. So speaking of monsters, you have these creepy, scary monsters called corpsicules. Mm -hmm. is, did I pronounce that right? You really did. Nice. Yeah. All right. So how did you come up? with this idea for the corpse kills i mean that was it's in a way is basically a zombie but it's a zombie that's had another spirit shoved into it and then like takes over it and it goes and kind of runs amok um but it was also about this question of the heartbreak of sometimes we come up against our own people in in our struggles to survive and sometimes it feels like they're enacting someone else's agenda um but there they are and they're in your way and you have to figure out what to do um, cause you know, for, for, for Sierra, she's, she's coming up against like folks that she knows from around the way, like old guys from her neighborhood who were shadow shapers who were then turned into corpsicles and everything. And so, you know, that's her, that's an, an added struggle on top of having to just fight for her life. She has to fight against the image of someone that she actually knows and trusts. Wow. That's awesome. Cause you see the corpse skill and then there's really a deeper meaning behind it. Mm -hmm. It's not just this mindless zombie with somebody's soul, soul shoved inside of it. Exactly. That is really cool. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so it's Isel again. So you mentioned earlier how it was really challenging for you to write Sierra as a main character because she has certain aspects like mm -hmm. she's Afro-Latino mm -hmm. and how she is a girl. So how did you go about writing her as an authentic main character? Yeah, a lot of it, again, I think the most important aspect of, of writing, period, is listening. So number one thing is listen. Listening means you have to be quiet. You can't listen while you're talking, right? So, and you can't listen while you're getting ready to talk either, because that's another thing we'll do. We'll be like, oh, yeah, talk. I'm, I'm totally listening. This is the way I'm going to counteract that argument. You know, <laughs> like, that doesn't count. You have to really shut up and, like, actually pay attention um, to women, to people who aren't men across the board um, and, and listen, particularly when you start to get uncomfortable. Um, and that goes really for any privilege. Like um, I'm using gender in this particular way, but whether that's being cis, being straight, um, you know, being not black, like all of those things are things that, that, that allow us a certain degree of power. Um, whether we want to admit it or not, it's there. Whether we want to accept it or not, it's still there. And it will cause us to, first and foremost, if we're just talking from a craft perspective, we'll write badly because of those things. We won't do our job as writers, which again is to tell the truth, right? Um, in a deeper way, it'll also mess up our relationships. It'll make us be more harmful in society. There's all kinds of layers to how privilege can be damaging. Um, but ultimately, it means we have to listen, which means we have to be quiet. Um, and it, it means we have to be ready to fail and then figure out where to go from there. Um, and that's hard to do. It's really hard. Um, but it's much easier if you can do it before the book comes out and then you get dragged on Twitter. You know what I mean? <laughs> you need to be able to. And so you have to be able to have you know, people around you that will tell you the truth. And then you have to be able to hear the truth without jumping into your defensive crouch and just trying to fight it off and be like, yeah, but yeah, but yeah, but I thought I whatever. And I did my homework. And and then the other thing is, it's not a, about the facts. Facts are important. You have to understand history and you have to understand you know all these different layers of things but ultimately it's about power and it's about things that are deeper than we can even necessarily put words to it's a soul question sometimes um and that's hard we're used to things that you can just check off the box and be like okay i did that i did this i got this i got all the information boom i'm done i did my research that's what they'll tell you too a lot of you know these kind of like little like how-to things will be like just do all your homework just do the research and you'll be good that's not it the, the history is full of people who've done the research and then gone ahead and just wiped out entire communities because they understood them so well, they knew how to destroy them. That's not what we're trying to do. So it's about really going deeper than just the facts and the history and really being able to listen authentically and take, um, take critique and then do better. Um, as an author, you obviously have to get inspirations from a lot of different, for 
a lot of different places because mm-hmm. you have so many diverse characters. Where exactly do you get this informa- like inspiration from? Mm. Well, v- most of the time that I've been a writer, I've lived in New York City and in Brooklyn. And Brooklyn is just full of lots of different people. That's just the reality of that place. Most American cities are. That's what makes them great. What gets me is that you don't, that's, that's a, Again, like not something you see enough on the page, more and more so. But so many urban fantasy stories would just have these very monolithic looking communities in cities. And I was like, where's this place? I don't, I've never been there. I don't want to go there. I don't want to read about it. I don't understand it. Um, so a lot of it's just about, you know, we, 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 there's so much talk about diversity. Um, and diversity is a very weird and complex word that can be spun in lots of different directions, right? Um, but ultimately, what we're asking for, those of us who have been fighting for diversity for years now, are asking for books to tell the truth about the world we live in, because um, they haven't been for as long as they've been around. Um, and so that's what we're trying to write. So the truth about Brooklyn is that Brooklyn is a multiracial city, a uh, place, and it's in the middle of an immense historical power struggle because of gentrification, um, because of racist economics and all kinds of other things because of police brutality. All these things are realities on the streets of Brooklyn. It's not a political position. It's what's going on. Um, If you walk down the street, these are things you will see if you understand the stories that the street is telling to you. So as a writer, my job is to listen to those stories once again, listen, and be as honest as I can on the page about what I see in Brooklyn. So that includes having all kinds of, you know, Dominicans, Puerto Ricans, um, Mexicans, Jamaicans, all over the page because that's what there is in Brooklyn. Uh, so it's Isel again. Um, so going on a more personal note, mm-hmm. how did it feel when you held the first copy of your book? Oh, there's nothing like it. I, man, we're, I'm a writer, and here I am telling you that words can't even describe it because you're just looking at it, like especially with Shadow Shaper, which, as I said, was the first book I sat down to write. Right. So I had two books come out before it, um, and I, those books are dear to my heart, South Nocturne and Half Resurrection Blues, um, I love. And I, I wrote them in the process of trying to get Shadow Shaper published. So I'd already written Shadow Shaper, I was editing it, and in the meantime, I was waiting around for, for agents and editors to get back to me. Shadow Shaper, by the way, was rejected 40 times before it was published, 4-0. Um, and in the course of those rejections, first of all, like I said, I learned how to write better. Um, I learned a lot about publishing. And I also had to step back and just take on other projects because I could have just sat there and got rejected all day, but I probably would have given up at some point if I hadn't been writing new things. Um, And that's a really important thing just as an artist in general is like to always be creative. I mean, take breaks. Don't don't drive yourself nuts. Don't burn out. Doesn't do anybody any good if you burn out. But um, when you have recovered, stop and then start again and get to the next project because it's a lot easier getting rejected when you're all the way up in some other project and you're just busy in that creative zone. That's what it's really about is creating, right? So I was in that creative zone with Half Resurrection Blues and with a a bunch of short stories that became Salsa Nocturna, um, which by the way, take place in the same world as Shadow Shaper, but they're books for adults. So it was, I was just having fun. I love writing. So I was just still writing and those ended up coming out first. And then those were amazing to behold. And then Shadow Shaper was kind of next level amazing because that's what started it all. And that really felt like the seed of my writing journey coming true and then just being in a physical form. And the other thing is when you write a book, especially a book like that took so many drafts, it feels so scattered across the universe. I mean, literally on my office wall for a couple of years, I had this really messy diagram of the whole plot in like little rough cartoon versions that I would cut up and then paste back over and and tack on over here and move around. I mean, I changed it so many times. And so to see it consolidated into something you can just hold into your hands is magic. Hi, this is Ian again. Hey. So like us, there are a multitude of young men and women in our society that want to become writers when they grow up, or maybe they don't even know it yet. Mm -hmm. What's your message for all these young men and women? Um, you know, the main thing is to, to keep doing it. Um, just like I said, getting rejected 40 times, um, it was the work that would, that would keep me moving. So, you know, if you, if you finish and you submit and then you sit around, it it can get very depressing (laughs) because you're just like, all you're getting is rejections. But if you're creating work, it's, it transforms the process. Second thing is find your community of other artists and they don't have to necessarily be the same kind of art you're making. But if you really immerse yourself in a creative community, um, whatever that means to you, 
that will also help support you. And that's going to be people, not just people who just love your stuff no matter what and think you're great, but really people who will check you. Um, like we were talking about before, accountability, right? If you're really going to step up to be that writer, that artist that you need to be, you have to be able to hear critique about yourself. And a loving community will tell you about yourself. And they'll do it without necessarily like throwing you in the trash. They'll let you know, you know, this didn't work for me. Those are the really hard conversations to have between writers, but those are also the ones that make us better writers and that make the community a more loving one, even though it hurts sometimes. And so that's what you're looking for. So, you know, care about your craft, care about community, um, and just keep doing it, be diligent. And But not in a way, once again, I want to say this, like it's very important. Like Don't let anybody push you to the point of burnout. Nobody should do that to you. Not a, a not an editor, not a teacher, not a parent. You shouldn't be burning out. Like it's number one. Now that means you have to find balance. That you still have to hit deadlines. You still have to, you know, go through things and and deal with the world. Uh, but you have to do it in a way that's healthy. So if writing is burning you out, it means you have to take a moment, step back from it, you know, take a break, play video games, like take a walk, live your life. You know, I, I do most of my writing at the gym. And when I'm taking a walk, not in front of my computer, there's a myth they'll tell you, you have to write every single day. If you don't write every single day, you're not a writer. That's a lie. That's BS. Don't listen to that. Okay. Write when you're ready to write, write a lot, write all the time or whatever your art is, do it a lot. I'm not telling you to slack off. I'm telling you, know yourself, know that if you take a certain amount of breaks and then you come back, you will get the work done. I definitely don't write every day and I'm mad prolific. Yeah. Uh, it's Vivian again. Um, you mentioned earlier that you got rejected over 40 times. Mm -hmm. What helped keep you going? Because that's definitely very discouraging. Definitely. Um, it was that it was it was doing the work continually and it was paying attention to the there were voices throughout that process that would pop up from time to time and say, look, what you're doing really matters. And it matters to people that won't necessarily be in power to give you that book deal. But it still matters. And that was always something. So really what I'm saying is, because you might not even have that, that, that person might not come through at that moment when you need them to. But you do have to remember, like, who are you writing for? Who is your real audience? Who are your readers, really? Because they'll tell you that you're supposed to write for the whole world. And that's nonsense. That doesn't mean anything. You, what you're going to write if you think you're writing for the whole world is some really neutral, boring, kind of like just whatever. Um, those are usually boring books that, that are for everybody, quote unquote. Um, probably you're writing for your community or maybe you're writing for, you know, young people that reminded you of you, or maybe you're writing for older people because you want them to understand you better. But either way, you have a very specific idea in your mind and it doesn't have to be like exactly this demographic and blah, blah, blah. I'm not talking about making it a marketing plan. I'm saying, understand who your readership is and then speak to them in their language. Don't try to perform for some outsider because you think it'll get you a better chance of getting published. Talk to, talk to your readers. Talk to the people that you're really talking to. My favorite books are the ones that sound like you might just be in some like coffee shop with the person and they're just telling you their story, you know? Um, those are the best books. And I know that's hard to do because publishing is not the most friendly place in the world. Publishing is full of a lot of the same power and balances that the larger world is. It's 80-something percent white. Um, you know, and there's a lot of just struggle within publishing that we're all trying to sort of confront right now. Um, but you have to still write the best book you can write and do the best work you can do. And if you ground yourself in the understanding of who you're writing for and really hold that, then you'll find them and you'll find the people that will help you get there. Even if they're not those exact people, they might be the people in some position to help you reach those people. And that's what it is. Hi, it's Catherine again. Uh, by the sounds of it, you've had a lot of hurdles that you've had to jump over to get through the writing process of the book, getting it published, but what was your biggest hurdle that you've had to deal with with this publishing mm. and writing the book? Biggest hurdle? Hmm. Um, I think really holding true to what it was I always wanted to do was the most important thing. I don't know if it was the hardest thing, I think that's the most important thing to, to start with. That's what grounds you, you know? So like I said, very clearly with the process of writing the book, knowing what I wanted to say, ultimately knowing the, the secret heart of my book um, allowed me to then be flexible and learn how to write better in the process because I could keep that heart, that core of it to be what it was. That's also true in your journey throughout publishing, 
right? Because as a writer, as an artist of any kind, you're going to be interacting with lots of different people. You're going to be making all kinds of really difficult decisions. And those difficulties are multiplied by 10, by 1,000 when we start to think about the dynamics of race and gender and class. Um, it's complex. You, have to, you are forced to make very complex choices. You're forced to decide, you know, which hills you want to plant your flag on, which things really matter to you. Um, questions about cover art, questions about marketing, questions about translation, questions about italics. All these things, are, they seem tiny. As a reader, you're just like, oh, yeah, cool. Oh, that cover's great. Whatever. You know, as a writer, that's something that you're, you're standing for. It's your name on that book. No one else's name is on it. The publishing company's name is on it, but you're the only person whose name is on it. So the like the the long answer that I'm giving you is that it's the culmination of all those knowing how to navigate those difficult decisions. Um, and again, what will help you do that is community. Um, so you know, I know that if if I tomorrow I come up against something that I'm not sure what to do with because it's just a lot. You know, there's people that I'll call that have been through it before or that are going through it now. And similarly, I'm the person that a lot of other folks and similarly, I'm the person that a lot of other folks will call um, when they're going through it. And they know that they have me to, to ask those questions. I might not have the answer for them, but I'll be like, oh, yeah, man, I would do that with X, Y, Z book. And here's what I said and see what works for you. You know what I mean? So ultimately, you know, it's not about one challenge or another necessarily that was the hardest, although 40 rejections hurts. <laughs> um it's really about like how do you find stability in a in a in an ocean, you know, in a storm that isn't built for you necessarily. And how do you find not just stability but joy? Because ultimately, we have to enjoy. I love writing, like I said at the beginning, it's fun, um, and you have to find the fun in it even when times get rough. Hmm? Okay. All right, thank you guys. Thank you. All right, it's been Thanks great. Great questions. Thank you.